John A. McDonald became Sir John A. McDonald. He was given a wife and a title and 2,000 pounds a year for the rest of his life to shut the hell up and go back to Canada without the Kingdom of Canada Act. He actually uh, 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 did treason on the people of Canada. So let's take a quick look at the British North American Act. Now people say, well, these that, uh, that Sir John A. Macdonald was the father of Confederation. But when you look at the act uh, itself, you can see that as we scroll down into the act itself, it, uh, into section two, it's, it talks about the union, declaration of the union in section two, uh, part three, it shall be lawful for the queen by and with the advice of her majesty's most honorable privy council to declare by proclamation that on and after a day, therein appointed not being more than six months after the passing of this act, the provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick shall be one dominion under the name of Canada. And on and after that day, those three provinces shall form and be one dominion under the name accordingly. So when you go to the Interpretations Act 1889 and look up dominion, dominion means colony. So when, you, when, you, when we look at this again and we say shall form one colony under the name of Canada, those three provinces shall form and be one colony under the name accordingly. So, what did the Union create? Certainly not a confederation. It created a colony for the British Empire. Now, I'm going to step back in time a little bit to 1893 because I want you to understand what's really going on here. In 1893, they, they had a law that was created called the Statutes Law Revision Act. And it repealed 10 things within the British North American Act. Uh, the first thing it repealed was the enacting clause. It took that out, removed it. And the enacting clause is very simple. It says, be it therefore enacted and declared by the Queen's most excellent majesty by and with the advice and consent of her Lord spiritual and temporal commons in this present parliament assembled and by the authority of the same as follows. Now that was repealed, it was taken away. And there's a reason for it. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. Section two was also repealed. Section two, under the preliminary, says very clearly application of provisions referring to the Queen. The provisions of this act referring to Her Majesty the Queen extend also to her heirs and successors of Her Majesty kings and queens of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and Ireland. This clause was removed. So when we read through the British North American Act, and we go down through all of the various sections, there are 147 of them. Anywhere it says Her Majesty or the Queen or Her Majesty the Queen are referring to only one Queen, Queen Victoria. In 1901, on January 22nd, Queen Victoria died. And upon her death, this act died with her. Now you'd think, well, why would she do that? Well, you have to remember that back in her time, she had a, an illegitimate son born out of wedlock. And that young, or that young son had grown into quite a man, and she was getting elder in her years, and she thought that he might make a run at the throne and cause problems. So she had uh, this removed so that what would happen, including the enacting clause, so what would happen in, uh, upon her death they would have to go back to Parliament after they sat a new monarch and do a new British North American Act. In other words, take and rewrite the British North American Act because it had no enacting clause, it couldn't be reenacted. So they had to rewrite the entire British North American Act and then go through the same process of putting it through the court and chancery and having it issued to the Governor General at the Court of St. James with the new monarch. The problem was, is that they knew at this time that the Dominions, which would be not just Canada, but the dominions across the British Empire all wanted to be free. And they knew they could never get this reenacted. So what they did, they pretended like nothing happened. And the king then issued, through the court of St. James, the next letter's patent to the next governor general in 1902, I believe it was. Um, and 
it read exactly the same. The Queen, Her Majesty, all the way through. Nothing to do with the King, because they couldn't change it. The executive power, which is which is really the the crux of this, that people say, well, Doug, it's a constitution. We have it. It's it's in Ottawa. Mr. Trudeau patriated this. He brought it, to, and patriate means to bring for the first time. In other words, we've never had it before. And he never actually brought the original. The, 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 it's a photocopy in Ottawa. It's not even the original. Anyways, if we look at Section 3, Executive Power, it says Declaration, Declaration of Executive Power in the Queen. The executive government and authority of and over Canada is hereby declared to continue and be vested in the Queen. Don't forget, 1867 through 1901, Queen Victoria. The application, to, and section 10, is the application of provisions referring to the Governor General. The provisions of this act referring to the Governor General extend and apply to the Governor General for the time being of Canada or other chief executive officer or administrator for the time being. Now, it's very important, this, this particular phrase that I'm going to read. Administrator for the time being carrying on the government of Canada. So he is the government of Canada. Okay. On behalf and in the name of the Queen, by whatever title he is designated. Now let that sink in for a minute there. Critical when you're when you when you when you think about this. Okay. The provisions of this act referring to the Governor General extend and apply to the Governor General for the time being of Canada or other chief executive officer or administrator for the time being carrying on the government of Canada. So let's look at that. Carrying on the government of Canada, what does that mean? It means one thing. He is the government of Canada, period. And we can we can actually solidify that in section 12. All powers under acts to be exercised by the Governor General with advice of Privy Council or alone by himself. Doesn't need the Privy Council. He, he created the Parliament of Canada. He created the Government of Canada. It's his and he can work with it with the advice of the Privy Council or simply by himself. So once again I ask what did this constitute? Where, where, how did this confederate anything? It, it created a dictatorship, and that's all it created. And once again, it says, the, and I can, I'll read this because it's very interesting. All powers, authorities, and functions which, under any act of Parliament of Great Britain, or the Parliament of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, or the legislature of Upper Canada, Lower Canada, Canada, Nova Scotia, or New Brunswick are at the union vested in or exercisable by the respective governors or lieutenant governors of these provinces with the advice or with the advice and consent of the respective executive councils, therefore, or in conjunction with those councils or with any number of members thereof, or by those governors or lieutenant governors individually shall as far as the same continue in existence and capable of being exercised after the union in relation to the government of Canada be vested in exercisable by the governor general with the advice or with the advice and consent or in conjunction with the Queen's Privy Council for Canada or any members thereof or by the governor general individually as the case requires, nevertheless, except with respect, such exist under the Acts of Parliament of Great Britain or the Parliament of the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Ireland, to be abolished or altered by the Parliament of Canada. So, very interesting. When you read this through the way I just did, he has all of these other things, but the, but the tagline there is the Governor General individually. Once again, dictatorship not a confederation, and definitely not a constitution, as they may claim that this is. Now, we could, you, uh, people, I suggest that you go on and you, you um, go on to the Mythos Canada website and download uh, the British North American Act uh, that we have in a PDF file on the timeline and read it for yourself and go through it and say, okay, anytime you see the word the Queen or Her Majesty, the Queen, 
remember in the back of your brain that this is not Queen Elizabeth, this is Queen Victoria, and ask yourself, how does this apply to us? And I'll tell you, <laughs> once you understand it, you go, wait a minute, it doesn't. So I'm going to move on from the British North American Act, and I'm going to we're going to we're going to step off into uh, 1901 after January 22nd. Now I explained why uh, she did this because, but they didn't. They they knew that there was going to be a problem. So as far as in 1901, the British North American Act died. It became a dead document. Why? Because the executive power remains in Queen Victoria. Well, if Queen Victoria isn't around, how does the Dominion of Canada exist without the letters patent given to a governor general to create the Dominion of Canada? It does not. So the Dominion of Canada, which this document created, ceased to exist, legally and lawfully. But that's not what happened. They said, shut up, we're not going to say anything. And they started holding what they called their imperial conferences. And they were very scared because the imperial conferences needed. So the imperial conferences were made up of all of the prime ministers uh, from all across the dominions. So the prime minister of Australia, the prime minister of uh, New Zealand, the prime minister of South Africa, the prime minister of uh, uh, the Ir Irish uh, government there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they were always held in London, and they, they held their first one, I believe it was in 1907. And the whole idea behind that was to figure out what can we do to maintain our power over the people and not let them know that we actually don't have it, that it's all in their hands. And <laughs> so, it, so Australia said, well, if there's no power, then we're going to create a constitutional government. And they did in 1901. <laughs> They seated, they seated, uh, legally, lawfully uh, created a constitutional government. Uh-oh, that's trouble, because New Zealand now is like, wait a minute, and Canada's like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, the reality was that they already knew that, uh, and, and, and so in 1907, they held their first imperial conference to kind of try to figure out 1911, they did another one. I'm not going to get into the details. Once again, you can go on Myth is Canada. On the timeline, uh, you can download each of the Imperial Conferences and read them for yourselves as to what went on at the Imperial Conferences. What I want to do is take you to 1923, because Canada decided that they were going to go do a treaty outside the purview of the British Empire. And they did. They, they signed a halibut treaty in 1923 with the United States. And the UK went, oh, you can't do that. But we did. What are you going to do about it? And they said, well, nothing, because you're free to do that. Uh-oh. <laughs> the dam is starting to leak. The information is starting to get out. But in 1926, they did a, a secret imperial conference. This, this one was not publicized at all. And uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Russell Rogers Smith in 1926, uh, in September, who held a meeting uh, called the Native Sons of Canada meeting, and they created the minutes that he gave to his friend, Mackenzie King, in October, and Mackenzie King took them to the Secret Imperial Conference. And the Secret Imperial Conference incorporated them into uh, the document that was created at that conference, along with a couple of other things, that is called the Balfour Declaration, 19. 26. Um, and it's the same Lord Balfour that did the Balfour Declaration 1918 for Israel. Same guy. So in 1926, he created the Balfour Declaration 1926. So and we, and we'll move along a little faster here. So in 1930, they held a, another imperial conference. And this imperial conference was designed to get all of everybody on side to figure out what we're going to do with the Statute of Westminster. So they wanted to create a Statute of Westminster, and so they said, okay, this is what we need. The Balfour Declaration was incorporated into that uh, meeting, and then that whole minutes were turned over to the UK Parliament. And the UK Parliament took from those minutes the creation of the Statute of Westminster in 1931. And you can read the Balfour Declaration. I put that up on the on the website and download uh, that as a PDF. Also, I put up the uh, Native Sons of Canada 
1926 meeting uh, as a PDF, and you can read that. And it's really important that you understand the foundation that the uh, Statute of Westminster came from and what it was designed for. The Statute of Westminster was designed to allow the dominions to be free to seat their own de jure constitutionally created federal authority. And so Australia had done that in 1901. Then uh, it, I think it was 1937 that um, New Zealand did that. Um, South Africa, along the same timeline, uh, the, the, uh, the um, Irish, the same, along the same timeline before the 1940s, et cetera, except for one, and that was Canada. As a matter of fact, the Dominion of Canada freaked out and said, no, 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 nothing has changed. We are still the Dominion of Canada. And now I'm going to explain why they did that. And it comes right down to a little thing called the British North American Act of 1930. It's actually quite a long act. It's uh, about 39 pages, I believe. It's almost as long as the uh, 1867 Act. And it incorporates within it the schedules for Manitoba Memorandum of Agreement, for Alberta, for Saskatchewan, and for British Columbia. And you go, hmm, why would they do that in 1930? So what are these memorandums? Well, the memorandums are actually for creating the Natural Resources Acts for those various provinces. So the, Manifor the Manitoba Natural Resource, I'm sorry, Transfer Act. <laughs> Very important word I left out, Transfer Act. You go, wait a minute. What do you mean transfer? What? Who's transferring what to whom? Well, the way the act reads, you know, transfer of public lands generally. In order that the province may be in the same position as the original provinces of confederation, they actually lied, are in virtue by section 109 of the British North American Act 1867. So let's go read the British North American Act 1867. Section 109 of the British North American Act 1867 is, says property in lands, mines, and etc. All lands, mines, minerals, and royalties belonging to the several provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick at the Union. Remember that, at the Union, under the Dominion. And all sums then due and payable for such lands, mines, minerals, and ro or royalties shall belong to the several provinces of Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, in which the same are situate or arise subject to any trusts existing in respect thereof and to any interest other than that of the province in the same. Now that part talks about the federal authority having claim. So under the Dominion, which is at the Union, so when you read this, you go, hmm, well, at the Union, it belonged to the provinces and it belonged to the federal authority. They had their beak in the, in the water dish or their snout in the trough. If you look at, and you, go, and, and you can go into the details on these uh, uh, land or resource transfers, it's really interesting. An act respecting the transfer of the natural resources of Alberta. And who are they transferring them to? They're transferring them to the federal authority that died in 1901 and hence publicly died in 1931 and was screaming from the rafters, no, we didn't. We're still the Dominion of Canada. And this is why the theft of the resources of we the people that were given to us under the Statute of Westminster that ended the Dominion of Canada, that turned the land back over in elodium to we the people, the provinces and territories of the, the landmass commonly known as Canada. They scream from the rafters in Ottawa that nothing changed, except when they were asked the question, so where's the new Governor General? Where's your Governor General? Well, uh, we're the Dominion of Canada. Yes, but where's the Governor General? Where is his letters patent? Well, we're the Dominion of Canada. Yes, we understand you're the Dominion of Canada. But where's your Governor General and where are his letters patent? Now, here's a quote 
The United Kingdom in December of 1931 recalled their governor general and said in the future, no department of the government of the United Kingdom is concerned in any way with the appointment of another. And this is file number 624-30, Department of State for External Affairs, the United Kingdom. Okay, it's a direct quote from December of 1931. So how can the Dominion of Canada exist without a governor general and letters patent? Super simple, it can't. So, <laughs> What we're seeing today is all these lies accumulated. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little trip back in, back uh, to the statute of Westminster. And I want to I want to kind of break it down a little bit to show people what I'm talking about here from Ho Canada. This is a book that was written by Russell Rogers Smith. and anybody who would like who doesn't have a copy of, of the book Ho Canada. I know that Duke Willis is watching our show here tonight can email Duke. Uh, through his Facebook page, or contact us through our Facebook page, or contact me directly at nephilimfilms at gmail.com, uh, requesting a copy of the book, Ho Canada, or in, uh, and the other book, Inside Canada. And the third book, Alberta, has the right to its, create its own sovereign credit. So I have all three of them in PDF files that I can send on. So this is from Chapter 8 of Ho Canada. For many years, I have had much to do with the question of the right of Canada to self-government. It is almost 40 years since I drafted the following resolution, the original of which is in the Parliamentary Library in Ottawa. The resolution, the first to come to the attention of the Imperial Conference in 1926, was presented by the Right Honourable William Lyon Mackenzie King, Prime Minister of Canada, without amendment or alteration, and after being seconded by Premier Herzog of South Africa. It was unanimously adopted by the assembled delegates from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the Irish Free State, and Newfoundland. The resolution, together with another short resolution presented to the 1930 Imperial Conference by Right Honourable Richard B. Bennett, Prime Minister of Canada, to the effect that the British North American Act should be retained by Canada was drafted by the Parliamentary Secretary and law officers of the Parliament into legal terms in sections of a bill to be presented to Parliament when enacted. The bill was entitled the Statute of Westminster, 1931. Now, in the years that have gone by, the feeling of satisfaction which I experienced for all sections of the resolution were incorporated into the Statute of Westminster has been replaced by a sensation of profound regret that Canada has not taken advantage of her enhanced position. It is evident that either the statute has not been properly interpreted or that it has been purposefully pigeonholed. It has been purposefully ignored. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to read the, the, uh, the uh, resolutions from the Assembly Number 2 Native Sons of Canada. You can download that and read it at your leisure. Um, but that as he says, was incorporated into the Balfour Declaration 1926. And it's very interesting that what happened was, and I'm going to open us open a, a document called the Statute of Westminster right now. <sighs> Russell Roger Smith was interviewed by a gentleman by the name of George Barr. He was King's counsel to the uh, government of Canada in 1947. And he got into a deposition. He brought a, a, a stenographer with him to meet Russell Rogers Smith at his offices in Montreal in 1947. And they were a little bit scared as to what was going on in, in Ottawa and what was going on around them back then is were the people starting to catch on. And if the people actually figured out what was going on, um, how bad could it be for them? In other words, would they wind up on the gallows? And so the man who worked with Mackenzie King on creating this, which was, which was incorporated into the Statute of Westminster, uh, the Native Sons of Canada, minutes. So who do you go to? Well, you go to the horse's mouth, and that's who uh, Russell Roger Smith was, the horse's mouth, because it was his stuff that was incorporated into uh, the Statute of Westminster that allowed Canada to be free and confederate. Provincial Cabinet says, Mr. Barr, 
the function and jurisdiction within the sphere of competence under the British North American Act is particularly the same as that of the Dominion cabinet within its sphere of competence. What, in your opinion, was the effect on Canada's status of the Statute of Westminster, Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith responds, the Statute of Westminster has altered the status of each and every province of Canada. Section 11 of the Statute of Westminster raises each province of Canada from a position of a colony to that of a sovereign state. And Section 11 reads, the meaning of colony in future acts, notwithstanding anything in the Interpretations Act 1889, the expression colony shall not in any act of Parliament of the United Kingdom passed after the commencement of this act include a dominion or any province or state forming part of a dominion. And Smith goes on, as there is no immediate status between that of a colony and a sovereign state, any province of Canada is no longer a colony. They must of necessity be sovereign states as they came within the requirements set for that in section 11. Mr. Barr says, well, you are aware of course, Mr. Smith, that under section seven, subsection one, the benefit of the Statute of Westminster insofar as the Dominion itself is concerned is withheld. That is, the provisions of Section 2 in regard to the Colonial Laws uh, Validity Act do not apply to the Statute of Westminster, or I'm sorry, do not apply to the British North American Act. Consequently, the Dominion of Canada cannot repeal or amend any portion of that Act. Is it not fair to say that that Insofar as the Dominion is concerned, the Statute of Westminster left us in exactly the same position as we were before that insofar as the Dominion Parliament is concerned. So you can see there in 1947, they're still screaming from their rafters, nothing changed, we are still the Dominion. And then Mr. Smith says, the answer is no. The British North American Act is a statute of the Imperial Parliament creating an ancillary body to aid and advise the Governor General. It could only be effective if there is a duly appointed Governor General for Canada. As no person receives any credentials from the Crown and Chancery to act as Governor General of Canada, we may, if we choose, disregard the British North American Act. As Section 7 uh, uh, paragraph 2 grants to each province individually those powers which were granted to the Commonwealth of Australia, the Union of South Africa, the Irish Free State, New Zealand and Newfoundland, the provinces of Canada can either assert themselves as sovereign states or they may mutually agree to create a union of provinces, a federal government. So people, you got to really want to see what happened here. You look at the statute of Westminster, by the way, um, I have this in a PDF file as well that you can also email and ask for with the whole Canada book. Um, I give this out freely at no charge to anybody. Um, if you feel that you, you want to do something, you can donate to us. We're, we're looking at that. We have a donate page. You can see from just this, this reading here, and I'll go on here in a minute, that Canada was the, the provinces were free and the territories were free to federate or confederate or create a constitutional convention and see to de jure federal government. But the federal government did not want that to happen. And it comes right back to section 109. They is because the second that they would have stepped away and said, please confederate or federate a federal authority, all of their power, all of their wealth was gone in a microsecond. All of this work they did from 1901 to 1930 with the British North American Act co-opting the resources in the Western provinces. And now if you look at Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and British Columbia, how wealthy they are compared to the rest of Canada. No kidding, they don't want to give that stuff up because at the end of the day, if they can control the food that you put in your mouth, do you think you're going to be eating steak every day? <laughs> So let me continue. So Mr. Barr goes on to say, what if any difference is there in respect to the appointment of the Governor General in Canada since the passing of the Statute of Westminster? And Smith says, in answering your question, I may say without fear of contradiction that since the enactment of the Statute of Westminster, no Governor General has been dispatched to Canada by the British government. 
And you could see where I read that little uh, quote from the British government, from external affairs, that he is absolutely correct. It's an interesting uh, bit of a timeline here that I'm going to incorporate here. By way of parliament uh, preliminary to answering this question, the following statement is illuminating. The debate on the Quebec resolutions, uh, October 10, 1864, in the legislature of Upper and Lower Canada, ended by ratification March 13, 1865. I know I'm reading these dates rather quickly, but it, 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 it's okay. We, we, you can connect the dots. Immediately, the Imperial Parliament countered the move by, you now the Imperial Parliament is the British Empire's Parliament countered the move by enacting the Colonial Laws uh, Validity Act, June 29, 1865, to show the colonists that it was they and not the colonial legislature that had the power to govern. Revising the draft and briefing the Quebec resolutions in the form of a bill called the Kingdom of Canada Bill, John A. Macdonald and the delegates from Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick presented these to Earl of Carnarvon. Remember, my once upon a time at the beginning here. So this is just further, and he was Secretary of the Colonies, December 26, 1866. Instead of bluntly refusing, the Earl of Carnarvon delegated Lord Thring, Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasury, to draft a bill to conform as much as possible to the Kingdom of Canada draft, but to nullify its purpose by not distributing it in any particular, the authority of the Governor General to act as a dictator. John A. Macdonald got a wife, a title, and a membership in Her Majesty's Imperial Privy Council, and Canada got the British North American Act letters packed. <laughs> we got the shaft, and he got the money. So, Barr says, under these circumstances, Mr. Smith, what would you recommend be the Canadian uh, be to the Canadian people in order to remove the anomaly and establish a government that would be sovereign authority that would have sovereign authority? In my opinion, the logical solution is a federal union of the provinces. It is logical for us to decry disunity in Canada before a union has been achieved. So, back when this was done in 1947, he was still saying that we have an opportunity to still do a federal union legally and lawfully. The problem was and we'll get into that, uh, in, in 1982, that went right out the window. The um, provinces and the, and the federal authority became maritime incorporations. And as far as we in the provinces having any authority uh, whatsoever to create a federal union uh, was, was basically swept under the rug. And to this day, um, they still say that they are in control.